Hello and welcome to our presentation today, Bridging the Gaps, Engaging Residents Through Activities. Today's presentation is proudly presented by Cassia, which is an Augustana and Elam affiliation, and Emerald Crest Memory Care, which is a ministry of Cassia. Today I'm your host, I'm Christine Drasher. I'm with Emerald Crest Memory Care. Um, Emerald Crest has four locations in the metro area, Burnsville, Minnetonka, Shakopee, and Victoria, and we've been doing memory care for over 20 years. We have a very unique program and model. Uh, we, our philosophy is rooted in the belief that individuals with dementia are unique and can flourish in an environment that provides them with opportunities for positive relationships, participation in daily care, and meaningful activities that promote success. Uh, we solely are dedicated to memory care and offer a unique program to meet residents' needs. Uh, you can see there that we have um, an environment that is serene and easy to navigate. We have houses of 12 to 15 residents per house. Um, and then we also have our rooms surround our common space. So it's very easy to navigate in our environment. Uh, we focus on ability rather than disability. We actually have different levels of dementia care. And within those levels, we actually provide a very specific program for those individuals at each level. We also provide very personalized care plans that are tailored to our residents' needs. These care plans are developed by both our uh, registered nurses and our occupational therapists. And they work very closely with our caregivers who are trained specifically on dementia. Um, you can see our four locations are listed there for you along with the contact information of our admissions person, Elizabeth. Uh, she'd be happy to set up a time for you to um, do a virtual tour, uh, but also just uh, possibly talk on the phone and, and, and learn more about Emerald Crest. As I also mentioned, Cassia is also another sponsor of today's presentation. And Cassia is actually an affiliation between Augustana Care and Elam Care. Uh, Cassia, the name actually means the heart of a servant, and our mission at Cassia is to foster fullness of life for older adults in the spirit of Christ's love. You can see here that we have five states uh, that we provide services in. Majority of our services are senior housing. We have all different ranges of senior housing, um, from independent living all the way to um, uh, skilled nursing facilities where we offer um, long-term care and short-term rehab. Uh, we also have other branches of services such as hospice, home care, pharmacy, technology, medical supply, and rehab therapies, as you can see there. For more information, you can go to our website at cassialife.org uh, to uh, see all of the different services and communities we offer. All right, we're going to get started today with our presentation. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Our speakers today come from Emerald Crest. They are occupational therapists that work hands-on with dementia residents. Give you a little overview of what their role as an occupational therapist at Emerald Crest is to work with the housing director, nurse, direct caregivers, and families to identify what challenges or gaps our residents may be experiencing due to their dementia. Both Jenny and Sarah work very closely with that team to identify and develop strategies and techniques to fill in those gaps so that we can maximize the resident's abilities and level of function. Sarah and Jenny focus on cognitive assessments, behavior management, staff training, and finding opportunities for residents to participate in daily care and meaningful activities that promote success and self-worth. So I'm very, um, proud and excited to uh, turn it over to both Jennifer and Sarah as they go through the presentation today. All right. Well, thank you, Christine, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for um, joining us from the comfort of your homes or your offices. It's, it's wonderful to be able to do this in this way with everybody. Um, so like Christine said, we are going to talk about bridging the gaps that people have in their lives for activity. Um, all people have a need for activity, as you can see in this little cartoon here. Um, we're always doing something as human beings. We all have a need for activity. 
as kids, as we'll see on the next slide here, um, as kids, we, we, are, we are doing the job of play as kids. And you can see in the picture, all these kids are just doing something different and having fun. That's how, that's how we learn as kids. And when we learn all we need to know as kids, we grow up into adults. And as adults, we hit the workforce and we keep our, ourselves busy with, with paid work. And then when we are not working, when we're lucky enough to not be working, we find some time for play. We've all got to find that, hit that balance for, um, you know, that work and play. Um, so what I, what I like to throw out when we um, do presentations with people um, is, you know, I ask people what they, what they do in their free time. Um, before I do that, before I put that out to all of you, I would like to pose this question. Does our need for activity change if we were to get dementia, when somebody gets dementia? Um, the answer to that question is a resounding no. As human beings, we, um, we continue doing. Um, dementia does not mean that we stop. So um, what I do, like I said, like to throw out to the crowd is um, during these presentations, I like to ask, what are those things that you like to do in your free time? So um, we'll pose that question to our um, chat here. So if you'd like to an enter in some of those um, things that you like to do in your free time onto the chat button on the bottom there, um, please feel free to do so. And we'll just shout some of those things out. So um, let's see, it looks like we're getting some things in here. People like to hike, um, I see reading, gardening. It's just about time to get out there and garden now that our snow's melting. Um, socializing, getting together with your friends and your family. Um, again, that's been hard right now, but um, trying to do that all safely. Um, so yeah, we can see that there's a lot of things that people like to do um, in their free time, and that doesn't change when somebody gets dementia. So um, that's what we're going to. Um, that's what we're going to talk about here the rest of the the rest of the morning um, and our objectives for the day are to um, hopefully help you all understand that the need for activity continues across the lifespan, dementia um, included. Um, folks with dementia need a balance of rest and activity. We'll talk about what that looks like. Um, by the end of this presentation, we hope that you'll all recognize the importance of structure in the lives of people with dementia. And we'll talk about how to help you create that structure for your loved one or that person with dementia. And finally, we hope that you all will understand uh, the considerations in determining appropriate activities for people with dementia. That'll be the second half of our presentation. So without further ado, we're gonna dive right in. Um, moving forward here, whenever we start a presentation, typically out in the community, um, even with our new employees, um, we do want to do a quick review of, of dementia, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I would like you all to again utilize that chat feature and answer this question. What comes to mind when you think of the word dementia? So it doesn't have to be an extensive answer, words, phrases, um, just take a moment to type, type a couple of your thoughts in. Mm -hmm. Sure, I see memory loss, confusion, loss of cognitive ability, brain changes. Confusion, interference, I like that word, interference in cognition, frustration, of course, you know, all those things you're um, saying here, loss, loss over the control of your own life, the biological answer, atrophy of the brain, yes, absolutely. People with dementia are misunderstood. Um, wonderful, Morgan, I think that's something that a lot of us um, in the dementia care, memory care world, um, want want the rest of the world to know is that people, these these folks are just misunderstood. Um, people with dementia have a lack of awareness and a lack of insight. Um, one, excellent. Thank you all for sharing. That is a good um, a good jumping springboard off into kind of the next slide here. It's just a brief slide. Um, that definition of dementia, which you all pretty much defined for me. 
Um, when, when a lot of people think of dementia, the first thing that does come to mind is often memory loss. Um, because a lot of times that memory loss is the first thing that we as family or friends or acquaintances notice first about, a, well, about somebody when they're, when they're slipping into dementia. However, behind the scenes, a lot of times people are struggling with other things. Um, because dementia is a, a, a bunch of brain changes, as somebody indicated, it's a bunch of symptoms or changes um, in the brain that affects people's ability to um, manage their everyday life. And um, it just affects all those things that our brains do for us, keeping things organized. So um, a lot of times people behind the scenes, uh, behind that memory loss that maybe is more visible, they are struggling. They're struggling with organization, organizing their life at home, at work, uh, managing their finances, kind of getting through that day seamlessly like they did prior to their dementia. So um, those, are, those are some of the things that we need to dig deeper to, to learn when somebody has dementia is what have they lost? Um, you know, and when when the memory loss becomes more apparent that it is that it is actually bigger and deeper, we are starting to cease cease trouble with that person. Just managing their own personal care and their getting through a day, getting through a day, and that is when they're needing more more of that assistance from us. Um, the next slide, and the next slide you'll see, and I, I think this is kind of a valuable little reminder or resource to even use um, when you're talking to people about dementia. Um, you know, educating or sharing with your family is that dementia is not just memory loss. This is what we call our components of cognition or wheel of cognition. It just um, summarizes all of those brain changes that happen because our brain is atrophying because the brain cells can't communicate with one another. Um, so we see changes not only at the top there in memory, but in orientation, people get very disoriented. They have a hard time initiating um, things in their day. That's why a lot of times you see folks with dementia just sitting, not doing anything, um, because they've lost that, that drive to initiate. Um, poor judgment, poor decision making um, is something very apparent that we see as somebody um, slips into their dementia. Um, as somebody declines further, you start seeing changes in language skills, not being able to find the right words, um, carry a conversation, they don't have the, the attention span for that. Attention is something that um, gets kind of fractured when somebody has dementia. Um, People get more frustrated that with somebody, well, what somebody put in our chat section is frustration, um, frustration with the losses that you're experiencing. Um, somebody with dementia um, does not do well reasoning things out. You know, I, I funny thing, I just worked with a lady this morning who um, she's end of the end of the early stage, beginning of the middle stage of dementia. And um, I got there this morning to see her for cares. And um, I, I said, oh, well, I brought everything you need for a shower. She said, oh, I already took my shower. Well, the shower was dry as can be. There was no soap in the shower. Our soap dispenser was empty. There were no towels in there. So um, as again, I, I wasn't able to reason with her that, oh, these things aren't around. So you have to rework your approach. But anyway, just those are a lot of changes that happen when somebody has dementia. As somebody gets into the later stages, we see things like um, their awareness shrinking, their motor skills um, become more poor because your brain not only controls those thinking skills, it also controls um, how your body moves and how your muscles and joints work together. That's your brain telling your body what to do. So um, there are just a lot of changes that happen and this is a, this is a good summary of many of them. So um, that is just kind of your quick, quick review of some of those changes. Knowing that all those things are changing, we have to really think differently about a person's abilities with dementia. Um, as their dementia progresses, we do know that they're going to have a harder time understanding the information coming in, um, understanding what's going on around them, and that does affect their ability to um, complete activities and tasks that they used to be able to do um, so seamlessly. And so um, what, what we have to do is work within the skills they have left and adapt. Um, looking at the next slide, the changes. So looking for those changes in somebody that does have dementia, what do you notice um, related to their activity, to their busyness? Um, you will notice that somebody with dementia um, isolates more. They withdraw from uh, social activities. They don't want to leave their apartment or room. A lot of times that is because that person is noticing that they are having challenges engaging with others and doing things. And so they want to withdraw. 
any of us probably would want to do that because we feel insecure or embarrassed. Um, somebody, somebody with dementia that that is saying, I need more in my, I need activity. Um, you're going to see them sleeping more because they just don't know what to do. You might see them watching lots more TV. The television is on, but, but are they taking in that information? Um, overall, just being more passive throughout the day, just, you know, instead of active, um, opposite of that is passive, just sitting, kind of letting the world go by. Um, and a lot of these things, you know, the when we're idle, that in, that can increase anxiety, and so we do see that in individuals with dementia. So all of those changes are are hard to see. So you don't want the person to be in that that situation or that state. Um, so we see these changes. What do we do about it? Um, what do we do about it? Well. Um, because we know that folks with dementia, we just talked about, lose the ability to initiate, plan, complete activities on their own. That's where we come in. That's where caregivers, um, uh, family members, uh, adult day programs come in, step in to plan and execute activities. And what that looks like is we are providing structure for that person. We are providing the framework for their day, that to-do list for their day, because they can't anymore. Um, so what does structure look like? Structure looks like a consistent daily schedule um, created by a care partner for that person. Um, you know, again, looking back at ourselves, we all have our automatic routines. Um, if we're still working, we're getting up in the morning, taking a shower, getting dressed, having breakfast, going to work, doing our tasks throughout our job, whatever those are on our work to-do list. But that's all, that's all natural. That comes naturally. We don't have to think about it. Um, we as care partners for somebody with dementia, we need to be the brains behind the operation to structure their day. And the structure we provide, we want it to be a balance between activity and rest. Um, you know, I think all of us need to strike a balance between activity and rest, but especially for somebody with dementia, knowing that their brain is not working as much and as quickly as it once had, it does need time to rest and recharge. So we as, as care partners for um, the person with dementia need to find a balance between the activities we help them engage in and the rest that they get. Um, and very similar to that, um, finding a delicate balance between stimulation and overstimulation. Uh, you know, I, what comes to mind most with that is, um, you know, if, if you're at home and you're doing activity with somebody, um, and the radio and the TV are on while you're trying to um, bake a, a batch of cookies with somebody, that might be too overwhelming. So um, within the activity and within the day, we have to look at the level of stimulation that we're providing to, um, providing to that person. Um, so what is important in the schedule that we create for that person with dementia? Routine and consistency are key. Um, you know, predictability, familiarity, all of those things are going to bring comfort. So by having a predictable, consistent routine, what that looks like is we're doing the same activities at the same time for, with that person. We're following that same routine seven days a week. Um, we're using the same procedure for activities. There, again, is comfort in that for the person with dementia. Um, for us, for, for, for their care partner, the person without dementia, um, we thrive more on variety. The person with dementia thrives more on that consistency and predictability and familiarity that, again, like I said, just brings comfort to people. Um, so we have to think how, as care partners, we're going to provide that structure and why it's really important. So. Um, why is structure important? What do we do? Um, why do we do it? Um, mentioned before that structure is important because that person can't plan. So I said, we need to bring the brains behind the operation, bring control to that chaos that that person with dementia is feeling. You know, the, the, the passiveness, the sitting, the watching TV, that's probably just because they feel like their world is much too chaotic. And so we need to provide structure to bring a little more control back to that. So their brain isn't so, um, you know, spinning and, and they're so worried. Um, what we need to do when we provide structures, make it predictable and reliable for that person. Um, and, and by doing all of this, it helps us to um, decrease behaviors that we see in that person. And when I talk about behaviors with somebody with dementia, it's 
it's really um, some of these things listed on this slide here. Um, you're going to see that person maybe exhibiting signs of anxiety, pacing, they're agitated, they're short, they're, you know, they, they, they snap at you, they're yelling, they're more frustrated. You can just see it. Like you can see in this lady's face, you can just see that she's overwhelmed, that she's frustrated. So um, I want to introduce you to somebody um, that, you know, is experiencing this, this overwhelming um, feeling because she doesn't know what to do with herself. She's pacing, she's She's agitated. Uh, this come. This happens a lot of times later in the afternoon. She gets gets very frustrated, and she just keeps pacing and wringing her hands, and um, just not in a good place. So, how do you help somebody that feels that way? What is she seeking? Well, she's seeking some structure. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Freddie. Um, she was always very, very busy. She had a very high paced governmental job. Um, when she wasn't working, she was volunteering. Um, she did like to be busy. She enjoyed going to the theater. Um, and just she had a very rich life. And now she's she's at home in her apartment by herself. Um, um, at, at Emerald Crest, we call them apartments for some of our residents. She's at she's she's there. She's alone and she doesn't know what to do. And so what did we do to help her? Well, knowing her history, um, we were able to try and engage her in things that she used to enjoy, you know, outside of work, she enjoyed going to the theater. So we put music on in the room for her from Broadway shows. Um, we, when she was at, when she was out in the common area, we just had, you know, music on out there too. And we would dance with her. Um, again, that was more fulfilling that added added some pleasure to her day and added a little bit of structure that afternoon. We set that into place, listen to music, dance with her, that kind of thing. So um, that's just a, a brief example. And how do we get to that point? How do you get to that point um, with your um, loved one, client, resident that has dementia? Um, how do we choose what an appropriate activity will look like? Um, now the formula that you know Jenny and I as occupational therapists have found to be very useful um, in our our day to day practice and helping people become more settled is to one learn about that person's past history like I was saying about Freddie we knew what kind of work she did what she enjoyed doing in her um, off work time her hobbies her interests so gathering that past history and interests of a person is very important because not all of us like to do the same things um, or have the abilities to do some of the same things. And um, we also have to consider because this person has dementia, what are their current abilities? Uh, what can what can they do? So um, we'll look more closely at, at how you can kind of dig into that past history on somebody here. Um, it is important to get to know the person. Um, if it's your loved one, that's probably a little bit um, closer to, you know, your heart than it is if somebody's a, a resident or a client of yours. Um, you know, if, if that's the case, asking family and friends for information about what made that person um, who they were, what, what things did they enjoy, what made up their life. Um, Important also when you're learning about these things, realizing that um, abilities change and interests change too. You know, maybe as a teenager, this person was very active in track and field and did the long jump. Well, that that interest probably has changed as they get into their older years. So um, again, it's important to know what they used to like, but also um, learn what they do like um, in more present day times. Um, and as, as care partners, um, the other thing to think about about interests is that we need to just think about what's purposeful for that person in the here and now. Um, again, it, it'd be very person-centered. It's about that person with dementia um, and it's not about us. And sometimes that's hard to kind of disconnect. Maybe it's you and your spouse and the things you used to do together. Maybe those things aren't going to work anymore with the person. So we kind of just need to make that paradigm shift to really focus on what that person's abilities and desires and, and interests really are. Um, so honing in, on, honing in on interests is very important. Um, 
and just thinking about, you know, what is purposeful. Um, for some of us, purpose is just kind of keeping busy um, around the house. It's doing some of those household tasks that we always used to do. Um, cooking a meal, cleaning the house, getting out in the backyard and gardening, doing the laundry, some dishes. Um, we've got just pictures there. Um, getting out in the garage and working on a project. Um, taking your dog for a walk, you know, thinking about what's, what's purposeful for people. Um, that's really important to, really important to remember. Don't just, um, we don't want to just focus on activity for activity's sake, just, just to do something. You know, it's important to do have purpose and, and meaning in that. So um, how do we, you know, in that, that second part of the equation, um, we talked about past history, history and interest, how do we figure out what a person's current abilities are? Um, again, getting to know them, observing what they do, how they do things, um, and do an assessment. Um, occupational therapists have a lot of tools in our toolbox to assess a person's um, physical abilities with um, cares and meals and, and activity. Um, we have different tools and we trial different things, you know. Um, maybe this person used to enjoy doing woodworking, but at the stage of dementia that they're at, they can't um, safely do that anymore, even with assistance. So trial, try different things, downgrade things. Um, and the, these are the things that occupational therapists are skilled at. Um, as that assessment piece and um, kind of putting together the pieces of what a person's interests are and what they can currently do at the current moment in time. So this is where I'm gonna pass it off to Jenny um, and Jenny will dive more into um, what our assessments measure and what that means and how we can mold that into activity for our, our individuals with dementia. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yeah, this the second half of the presentation is going to be looking at like what Sarah said is, you know, what do you measure in assessment? And I'm going to specifically be talking about a cognitive scale um, that we refer to as the Allen's cognitive levels as a method that um, we use heavily um, at Emerald Crest and as occupational therapists at Emerald Crest to look at um, different skills and what a person can and cannot do at the different stages of dementia. Um, but before I dive into those, um, where Sarah left off is what to measure in assessment. If you think back to that wheel of cognition um, that Sarah went over um, earlier in the, uh, the presentation, all of these areas um, we're on that wheel. So initiation, um, attention span, number of steps a person can um, do in an activity. Um, how do they sequence? Do they know what to do first, then second, then third? Um, are they goal directed? What's their frustration tolerance? Um, I know as occupational therapists, we're looking at all of those areas when we're determining what is appropriate activity or what is appropriate engagement um, for a person. So moving on to the Allen's cognitive levels, that's kind of what the rest of this presentation is going to focus on. Um, and the, for those of you that are not familiar with the Allen cognitive levels, it was developed by an occupational therapist. Her name was Claudia Allen back in the 1970s. And when she originally developed these stages or levels, it was geared more for those with mental illness. But in the last, oh, probably 15, 20, probably more, even more years than that now, it's been utilized with those that have dementia. And as you can see by the scale here, it's based on a six point scale. So six being somebody like you or I, somebody who is independent in all our daily tasks, our daily cares, have not been diagnosed with any type of dementia or memory loss. And it goes all the way to a one, which is severe cognitive impairment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what do activities look like at these different stages for people. Um, so if we look at you know, an activity, and I'm gonna take a simple activity as far as a puzzle, based on where that person's at, you can really break that activity of, of doing a puzzle down so that any stage really can be successful with it. And looking at these pictures here, um, the one on the lower right-hand corner, 
that would be some for somebody more in that um, you know early middle or early stage. Um, it's quite a detailed um, puzzle. It's probably got oh, what you know fifty to maybe even a hundred pieces or so. And then if you go to that next picture right next to it, it's breaking it down a little bit. So it's still completing a puzzle, but it's maybe not as detailed of a picture. There's far less pieces. So maybe somebody that's more in that middle stage so that it's more doable and, and successful for them. And then if you go to the top two pictures, you've got um, not only puzzles, but you have puzzles that um, are more based on the senses. And as I get into the later stages of dementia and activity, I'm gonna talk a lot about how activities are, ga are geared to alert, to engage, and it's really trying to um, work at engaging those five senses. So I don't know if you can tell by the picture there, but that one on the right hand upper corner, um, it's one of those kind of foam, type um, puzzles, squishy puzzles. Um, and again, uh, very big pieces. Um, it's, it's looking at different colors. So can they identify colors? That other uh, puzzle on the top left hand, again, I don't know if you can tell by the picture, but it's the six puzzle pieces, different shapes. So it's helping them to identify shapes, different colors. But if you have that in front of you, those pieces are different. Um, textures. So you have a, a puzzle piece that might be rough, one that is soft or kind of has a um, felt type of feel to it. Um, so it's different textures. So it's not only helping to the, them to identify shapes and colors, but how does something feel? Um, so again, just even a simple activity as a puzzle, it, it, that's a very good example here of how to break something down for the different stages. So referring back to the Allen um, cognitive level, the six point scale, I'm gonna start with the early stages. And when we refer to the stages of dementia and the Allen's level, people that are scoring kind of that low to mid fives and then all the way down to the mid fours are considered your early stage dementia. So these are people where when you take an activity, they really do well or still can do pretty well with activities that maybe involve reading, maybe like a book club, writing type of tasks, talking open-ended conversations. So a lot of their activities are, are socially based. Um, they engage with others in group settings. You can have open-ended conversations where you can ask them a question, maybe you know, what, they, what they did for a living, what did they enjoy doing um, in their younger years? And they can maybe expand on that and talk about those memories and those experiences. And they can even do some you know, imagining, um, visual imagination. Um, here is looking at activities in the early stage. And what we're gonna do with each of these stages is really break them down. What are the goals of activities at these stages? So when you're looking or working with somebody that's in the early stages and you're, you're trying to structure their day, find activities, you really wanna make sure that the tasks that you're presenting for them are have a clear purpose. They wanna know why they're doing something. Clear ending, a, a um, or clear beginning, clear ending, you know, they can usually do activities that are multi-step, so four to five steps. And you really want to look at attention span too. Again, we're looking at those different areas of cognition. So uh, a lot of the activities that people at the early stage can do um, are anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and sometimes longer. And you'll see on the right side of this uh, slide, we've got um, you know, suggested activities that often work well for somebody at this stage. And this is by no means um, you know, the only things, but just things that came to our mind. What you have to remember about this stage is most of the people in early stage are still living out in the community. They may still be living in their own homes with just minimal uh, services. Um, somebody, you know, people coming in to maybe help set up medications or help with, with cooking or helping with housekeeping. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty independent when it comes to activities. So activities could look like a lot of activities that you and I still do, you know, household tasks, like cleaning out the fridge or putting away dishes, laundry, dusting, 
like I said, they're very much still in the community. So they may be involved in their church activities or a book club or a card club. Um, a lot of these folks uh, to structure their day and feel purposeful still may want to do volunteering exercise classes, you know, maybe they're going down to the senior center and taking part in um, uh, leader led exercise classes. Uh, cooking is still big with a lot of these folks, they can still maybe do simple meals with just, you know, those four or five steps, you know, maybe it's making a sandwich on the stove or a microwave meal, something very simple. Um, and then it goes on the scrapbooking, woodworking, um, gardening. Um, and again, it's, it's being able to do these uh, activities with maybe some minimal supervision, or it's working on a project like cutting out coupons um, for when they go shopping. Um, arts and crafts are a big thing. You know, a person at this level, they probably could do a, um, a pretty uh, detailed uh, wood project, maybe such as a birdhouse that might take them a day or two to complete. So uh, very good um, examples of activities for early stage. Now, as I jump into middle stage, again, I'm gonna go back to that Allen cognitive level scale. You're now looking at people that are scoring, uh, I'd say on the high end, about a mid four down to the low four, sometimes high three. And you're probably wondering, um, right below middle stage, it says early, middle, middle, and late middle. And the reason why we have it broken down like this is because when you look at the stages of dementia, early, middle, and late stage, middle stage is usually the longest stage that somebody often functions in when they're progressing through the stages of dementia. And so when you take a person who's just beginning the middle stages to a person that's on the tail end, of functioning in the middle stage, those two people, although they're still both in middle stage, they can look very, very different, both in what kind of activities um, they can complete and how they function day to day. So when we look at appropriate activities and structure, we really have to look at the beginning stages of, of middle stage dementia. We have to look at um, different activities for those maybe saying in the, the later stage. Um, but um, the, the middle stage dementia, so early middle where I'm at right here is going to be successful activities at this stage are gonna be socially and conversation focused. So these folks still, they thrive on being in group settings where they can even do, you know, smaller group social activities, maybe even um, short um, community outings. Um, I know at Emerald Crest, we take our early middle stage folks um, on monthly outings, whether it's to Dairy Queen to get some ice cream or Perkins to get a piece of pie and coffee. We take them on those outings because they thrive. Um, they do well. Um, we're trying to um, keep their social skills up and their interactions up. Um, the verbal activities, though, do need to be led by care partners. Um, the activities need to, you know, be very simple tasks with more of a clear ending. And when you start to get into the middle stages, you want to make sure that your activities are including maybe more visual demonstration, props, that type of thing. And you'll notice as far as the number of steps they can complete and their attention span looks a little bit different than somebody in early stage dementia. So you're talking activities that are three to four steps, attention span, so an activity now that maybe is just 30 to 45 minutes long. Then looking on the right side, here's again, some more suggested activities for somebody in more of this early middle stage. Like I said, supervised short outings in the community are still great for these folks. Um, you're gonna be looking at a lot of trivia games, uh, short stories, um, you know, finish the phrase where you give them a, a a familiar phrase and let them finish it. Um, Penny ante is a game that we play a lot. When you're looking at exercise groups for this group, you know, video, like so following video exercises um, where you have the leader of the group up at the front with the video playing and then they're trying to do um, parts of the um, exercise video, um, doing it in a group setting. Cooking and baking is still very a very good activity for somebody in the early middle stages. So having them again, you're not doing um, you know a, a real detailed um, type of cooking or baking, but something simple. 
Um, household tasks still can be good. So maybe just simply folding laundry or setting the tables or um, cleaning up the tables after the meal or taking the hokey and, and vacuuming the floor. So simple household tasks. Um, again, we've just got listed some different um, games um, or trivia, name that tune. Um, reminiscing is huge at this level. So taking a um, topics, you know, wedding reminiscing is a popular one. We do at Emerald Crest where we have a box full of props that have to do with weddings and showing them different things. So maybe a bridesmaid dress or um, a cake topper and you talk about um, that prop and, and how it relates to weddings. And what you'll find is a lot of these folks, then it'll kind of jog their memory and they'll start to talk about their own weddings or their friends' weddings. And you'll start to hear them talk about these memories together. Um, videos that are more visual and not plot-based. Um, so relaxation videos um, are great. Um, music, sing-alongs, we do a lot of singing at this level, both, um, you know, with, with um, the CD or also also playing um, music um, sing-alongs on the TV where you have somebody singing with the words at the bottom of the screen works well. Um, again, simple games, cards can work well. So even solitaire or Uno, um, Go Fish, simple games like that. Sorting, a lot of sorting activities work well. So sorting socks, um, matching the socks, matching the colors, stuffing envelopes. Um, all very good activities at this early middle stage. Then, as I said, you know, we're breaking down that middle stage from the early middle to the middle or the late middle. So as we go back to that Allen cognitive six point scale, now you're starting to look at people that are functioning in that later middle stage. So that can be anywhere from a 3.9, high three, 3.8, all the way down to a mid three, three, four, three, three on that scale. When you look at kind of what these activities are focused on, it's more verbal activities led by your that, that care partner. And they've got to be very simple, very concrete. Um, and they have to be uh, activities that are prompted with simple answers or choices. So you can't leave things open-ended for these folks anymore. You really have to give them, you know, a choice. Do you want to, um, play basketball or do you want to bowl today for exercise or when asking them questions it's got to be questions that maybe they can answer with a yes or no you can't leave it open-ended so you know uh, when you grilled in the summer you know what did you like to grill did you like to grill hot dogs or hamburgers you got to give them that choice when you're doing different activities what you'll also notice um, as far as successful activities at this level is you're kind of going more now away from more of those social reminiscing talking type act activities to more doing activities these folks are starting to lose some of their language skills they are having more word finding difficulties. Therefore, those talking activities aren't going to be as successful. You're going to see more success when you have activities where they're doing, where it's focused around a prop. Um, again, using all five senses, but really about the objects, you're gonna see that the steps and the attention span are now getting less. So you really need to find activities that are maybe one to three steps. And again, your attention span, you can't have our long activities for these folks. It really has to be um, something that you can do in a 15 to 30 minute time. When looking on the right side, here are some of these activities that are more successful. You can see again, it's a lot of doing, not as much talking. So again, sing-alongs are gonna be great because those familiar songs, they will still remember. Um, games are still great. Exercise games are great, but they're gonna look a little bit different than in the early middle. They're not going to do well if you just put on an exercise video. You have to actually do, you know, instructor-led stretches, simple stretches or games. So, you know, we we have a ton of different exercise games we use at this level. You know, it might just be taking the basketball hoop and the basketball and seeing how many people can make three shots in a row or um, bowling activities. So setting up the pins and letting them bowl right there on the living room floor. Um, exercise is going to be more successful with actual games or um, 
uh, leader led exercise. Um, participating in single steps. So it's not like they can't do cooking or gardening, but they're not going to be able to probably do the whole thing. So it's, you know, we sit down for a cooking group and maybe we're making a fruit salad um, and you have one person just simply uh, mix in the bananas or mix in the peaches and another person just stirs the fruit salad together. So you have different people um, just doing different pieces um, one step at a time of the cooking activity. Um, sorting and organizing are great at this level. So, you know, we do various sorting, organizing um, activities, um, even taking index cards and having them sort all the red index cards in one pile, the yellow in another, the orange in the other, or taking um, pencils and putting eraser tops on each of the pencils, um, organizing silverware, the forks in one slot, the spoons in another, the knives in the other. Sorting and organizing are very good for these folks with, again, somebody leading it and cueing them. Folding washcloths, wrapping utensils and napkins, polishing shoes, all great activities at this later middle stage. Then as we go into now the late stage of dementia, again, going back to that six point Allen scale, you're gonna be looking at people at starting at the three, two, three, three, all the way down into the ones. This is late stage or end stage. This is always a really challenging stage, especially when I'm doing teaching with our caregivers on what's appropriate activity. Um, these activities are going to be very, very simple. They're going, their main uh, goal is going to be, um, we're trying to find activities that help to alert and engage the senses. So, you know, these are people that are at a stage where a lot of times they, they may sleep a lot of the day, you know, they're at that later stage of dementia, they're more tired, um, they need more rest. So to engage them and keep them alert can be a bit challenging, but it can be done. So that's why we're really looking at sensory based activities at this level. Um, we're using objects. Uh, that's all it really is, is how can we get them to focus and engage on an object, whether it's touching or feeling something, or it's listening to something, or it's looking at something trying to engage those senses. And where I struggle with some of our care partners or our caregivers sometimes is, you know, they'll, they'll take an activity and because it doesn't, you know, look like an activity you or I would do, they'll say, well, these, these, po these people can't do anything. This activity doesn't work. And what you have to remember as a care partner at this level is success when you're doing an activity with somebody in the late stage, looks very different than what maybe success for you and I would look like. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, playing basketball, we still do exercise with people in the late stage. Now, somebody in the late stage, are they going to be able to take the ball, reach up and throw that ball into the hoop? No, more than likely at late stage, that's going to be difficult for them to be able to do. But it's not about that what I say to care partners is place that ball in that person's hand. Let them feel what that ball, the texture of that ball. Let them look at it. What color is that ball? And then you're physically helping them to reach their arms up to that hoop and place the ball in the hoop. And what you're doing is, again, you're alerting them, you're engaging them, and you're working on that gross motor movement, that range of motion. Just getting somebody in the late stage to do that, that's success, that's, that's great. Um, and like I said, steps and attention span for folks, they're gonna look very different when it comes to activities. These activities might just be a one or two step activity. Um, you might only be able to get somebody at this stage to engage in a simple activity for five, 10, 15 minutes if you're lucky. Um, the way we have activities structured in our late stage house at Emerald Crest is every activity, and there's a lot of different activities we engage them in, but they're only 10 to 15 minutes, if that, before we move on to something else. That's where they're at as far as their attention. And you'll see it with the suggested activities on the right-hand side, it's very, again, sensory focused. So it's a lot of listening to music. And these folks, a lot of them still know familiar music. They'll still sing along. 
Um, it's a lot of, when it comes to activities, gross motor type of exercise. So like I said, if anybody remembers the parachute when you were in grade school, um, we've even done that with them. That's a great gross motor activity. Um, uh, like I said, the basketball hoop, even just rolling a ball across the table, great gross motor sensory, hand massages, back rubs, um, alerting that, that sense of smell with smelling different um, scents, smelling flowers in the garden um, in the spring and summer is great. Even simple walks for those that are still ambulatory is a great way to use up energy, um, um, get them moving, um, keep them ambulatory, simple walks. And then, um, you know, a lot of activities you want to find um, that are, again, one to two, two steps, a lot of times are repetitive. Um, those work well. So sanding a block of wood, um, that back and forth um, motion, that one to two step motion. Um, smoothing fabric or rolling yarn. Again, it's repetitive, but a very good activity for someone at that late stage. If any of you have ever heard of fidget blankets, they're blankets that have, um, you know, different things on there that they can touch, they can manipulate. So whether it's buttons or zippers or um, just different types of things they can fidget it with on, on the blankets, it's a great um, way to uh, again, keep them engaged, less um, lessen anxiety, agitation. Um, baby dolls, if you've had any experience with the real life looking baby dolls and also the animated pets, the ones that purr or bark or um, make different noises, um, those are wonderful for people at this late stage um, where they can interact. And I, 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 you know, I've had a lot of people kind of look at me like, eh, you know, is that age appropriate? For somebody at this level, it is. I've seen people that most of the days they were spent sleeping and napping and then you put a doll in their arm or one of these animated pets and they just light up. Um, it's brought a lot of the mothers back to when they were raising their kids back to those days. And you see them light up, you see them rock them, you see them kiss them, you see them talk to them. It's, it's pretty amazing to watch. So that's a great activity at that level. Even just sitting, a lot of family members will come in and just look at old pictures and talk about it with them um, or watch relaxation videos. So videos up on the TV that have music in the background and have soothing pictures across the screen. All great sensory focused activities. So just as we um, get to the end here, um, a few case studies just to kind of look at what both myself and Sarah have been talking when it comes to finding activities at different stages. So she talked about earlier in the presentation how when we're looking at appropriate activities, you have to really consider the past history of that person, where they currently are now in their dementia, what abilities they have. So meet Mr. J. So this gentleman, what we knew about him is he was a John Deere salesman. That was his job throughout his life. Um, what they were struggling with at the time with him is he was going around taking apart furniture in his home, um, which makes sense because he was a salesman. He worked with uh, John Deere equipment. Um, what we knew as far as where he was at with his dementia is he was into the um, later middle stages, late stages of his disease, and he was starting to have difficulty using objects correctly. So we had to figure out a way, you know, how could we still, you know, make him feel like he was, um, you know, maybe fixing the furniture or fixing the, the um, John Deere supplies um, but find something that he could actually do and do safely. And so that box that you see at the bottom of the slide, it's a, kind of like a trinket box where, you know, there's different doors and different latches um, that he can manipulate and work with and in a sense feel like, um, hopefully make him feel like he's back in his John Deere days um, of fixing equipment or um, putting together furniture. It was a way to still provide that for him. And they did do it with him quite a bit and they found it to be quite successful. We didn't see him walking around taking apart furniture anymore. We saw his anxiety and his agitation lessen quite a bit when we were able to provide him with something like this. 
Um, the next case study here, this is Mrs. H. Um, now she, her past history, she was a housekeeper most of her life. Um, what we were finding, what we were struggling with with her is uh, oftentimes late in the day, she would often be wandering around the house crying and quite upset. Um, we knew that as far as where she was at with her dementia, she was very much, again, in those middle stages, she needed a caregiver to really initiate activity, create activity for her and kind of schedule her day. She didn't know what to do on her own or how to do it. So what we came up with actually, knowing that she was a housekeeper is we thought, well, what can, what household tasks can we have her do that she'd be successful in? Um, so one of the very simple activities, we took those dusters, um, those feather dusters, and we just had her feather dust throughout the house, feather dust the furniture. Um, and we made it as, as like it was her job. So we took these blank checks with our organization's name on it. And we actually would write out these checks for her after she would do these cleaning tasks throughout the day. And she felt like she actually had a job with us, that she, she felt purposeful. It had, it, it had great meaning for her. And again, worked off very well. We saw a lot less anxiety, agitation, a lot less crying at, at the you know, later parts of the day. Um, and, you know, and another thing just to talk about before we wrap up for the day, I, the day is activities can be, be provided in a group. And we've kind of been talking about that throughout this presentation. Um, but when providing um, activities in a group, it's really important to consider the parts of a group. So here, what you're going to find, and, and this is how I educate our caregivers um, at Emerald Cross, is anytime you're leading a group, it doesn't matter what group, it could be an exercise group, it could be a reminiscing group, you always want to make sure that it has these five parts to it. So of course, the first part is planning it, making sure that you are organized and ready um, to um, initiate it. When it's time to start a group, it's inviting us and escorting everybody. And sometimes you got to be creative with people because a lot of times people will say, no, I don't want to. So it's inviting them. A lot of times I've had to really be creative in how I invite them. Um, I had one lady who she would never, she was very, very difficult to come out for group activities, but I knew that she always enjoyed parties. Um, she was kind of a party year back in her day and and um, she loved that social aspect. So anytime I'd go to invite her for an activity, I'd always say, oh, please join us for our party. We're having, you know, we're having um, a snack and something to drink. And the minute I said that, that sparked her interest and I could get her out. And once she came out, maybe we weren't even having an actual party. Maybe we were playing bingo or something, but I would just say, oh, please sit here, the party's going to start in 10 minutes. And then she would jump right into bingo and that's all you had to do. So getting creative, but always providing a clear invite and escorting them out. And then once you have everybody out to your activity, it's very, very important to have that clear beginning. So I always tell care partners, you want to introduce yourself every time, whether they remember you or not, introduce who you are. So my name is Jenny. Welcome them to the activity. Welcome. Thank you for coming to exercise today and actually going around and thanking each person. Um, Barb, thank you for coming. Michelle, it's so nice to have you today. And you want to do that each time. Even if you've met with this group every day of the week, you want to do that every time. And then it's carrying out the activity. Again, making sure that you're keeping the level of dementia that you're um, working with, keeping that in mind as far as what's appropriate activity. And then just like with that clear beginning, you also wanna have a clear ending to your group. So as you come to the end, it's again, I thank you for coming to my exercise group today and you're going around to each person again. Uh, Martha, thank you for being here today. It was a pleasure. Barb, thank you for being here. You want to have that clear beginning and that clear ending. So then they know that we're moving on to something else. So just to wrap up here, hints for successful activities. Um, the environment should be calm and that's huge. You can't be trying to do an activity, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or a group activity, if you have a really chaotic environment going on. So you don't wanna be having the TV on in the background or other conversation going on or the vacuum cleaner going. You need to have a 
calm environment to be successful. Um, you have to remember these people can't multitask. So if you have distractions going on in the background, they're not going to be able to focus on your activity. They're going to get lost real quickly. The leader should be present with energy. And that is huge. And, and it's, it's something that's hard to teach in others when you're trying to teach how to lead activities. If, if you're enthusiastic, if you're excited, if you um, are really animated when you lead a group or even when you're with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they're going to mimic that energy. If you just go into a group, hi, nice to have you today, and you're just very flat with no energy, you're not going to have a very successful group when you're dealing with folks that have memory loss and dementia. So you really need to have that energy. Present information in a clear and respectful manner. Um, so again, keeping, keeping the questions appropriate, whether it's open-ended or closed-ended, clear, concise, concrete. Um, activities, um, you know, like I said, should be concrete and simple. Success may be different for each resident. So a, a simple example is those pictures right there. Maybe you're doing a craft activity, activity and you're putting together that, that uh, flower. Well, one person might be able to do a four or five step flower, but maybe the, the other person can only do three steps of that, of that craft flower activity. And that's okay success is going to look different for each person depending on what stage of dementia they're in. So just to wrap up, remember all people, regardless of their cognitive ability, like to laugh and have fun. And it's, you know, our goal, I know, as occupational therapists to really, really look at their history, their current abilities, and how can we find the activities that are going to um, you know, make them feel like they are purposeful and having structure to the, that day. And uh, like I said, having fun and um, enjoying those around them. Wonderful.